שלום. שלום. You are answering questions already. So it's a bluff. Come on, that's that's the point. So in the meantime, who here knows uh, or is using Overt and created the storage domain? Okay. <laughs> you guys have no <laughs> Okay, I think we'll uh, start. Yeah. Okay, so Sean Cohen here is a uh, storage PM for Cloud and Red Hat. I'm Ayal. I manage uh, the engineering storage, cloud storage group in Red Hat. Um, the point of this buff is to go over trends and things we're thinking of uh, for future and storage in Overt. Um, I will be more than uh, glad to stop on any topic and even have the entire buff on a single topic yeah. as long as I have interaction. That's the point, right? So I'm. I'm not here to cover all the points we have on the slide. We have a lot. So anything that uh, you're interested in, feel free, please feel free to stop me, and I will uh, dive into it. Yep. I'll put it this way. You made it to the session. It's your session. Right? Yeah. Um, in general, the things that we can talk about, uh, not limited to, but I have slides on, is um, <clears throat> storage defined storage, um, software defined storage. So no storage uh, presentation nowadays that respects itself uh, goes without mentioning this, so we just stuck it in there. Um, <laughs> Buzzword compliant. Yeah, storage offloading, um, things we'd like to do for uh, getting better performance, replication, um, some of the things we'd like to see from the ecosystem, uh, integration with OpenStack, DRVD, and a little bit of the roadmap. Sean, do you want to? Yeah. OK, so oh, this is too long. Is it OK if I turn it off? Yeah. OK. I have, I have a good voice here. No one hears me. That's the idea it come from. <laughs> OK, so uh, this is basically where we are today. 3.3 uh, uh, beta was just released yesterday. Uh, so we're very excited. I think we're really getting to a point where Ovid is getting maturity. And, and a lot of the things you'll see in this list are things that actually we heard from the community uh, over and over again. And uh, uh, that's what's great about the Offered project, we, we actually listen. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the big things that actually came into play in this release is disaster recovery. And uh, disaster recovery is a big thing for any customer, uh, uh, especially if you're on virtualization and you have all your core products. Uh, that you need to protect. So one of the cool features uh, that uh, made it into 3.3 is actually 3.3.2. It's a, a new API uh, for ISVs uh, to be leveraged uh, via backup. Uh, the secret sauce behind it is something that everybody does in the market already today. We're going to leverage snap, snapshots. We're going to use temporary snapshots to be able to allow software vendors to do a backup from that temporary snapshot and then uh, 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 be able to uh, provide different levels of restore. Uh, the cool thing about it, the snapshot itself, uh, which is a transient disk, uh, includes also the configuration files of the VM. So in, you can have uh, 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 a different site running over it and have a new VM created, a new disk created, and just restore uh, a point in time to the now VM. So that's a big thing. It was missing. We had, Till now, we had export domains, import export domain. This is more granular. Uh, so the backup API will include also a single level restore capabilities in uh, uh, from the VM. So single file. Sing, single file. Yeah. Right? So, so it's not just domain anymore. <coughs> we can do up to a single uh, file. At the end of the slide, we'll talk about that. This is a starting point, right? So it's going to have a few phases. Uh, we're going to add more functionalities uh, uh, to it as we go, and we'll uh, talk about extending the API. 
also in the, uh, end of the presentation. On, uh, on a technical note, so just to be clear, this is sand, uh, WAN-less or LAN-less uh, backup. So we give uh, the backup software direct access to the to a point in time of the storage in order to be able to uh, back it up without going over the LAN. Um, you have access yeah. to the disk, not to a execution. Correct. So we, um, if we have a QCOW chain, and in this case we always do, then what the backup vendor sees is not QCOW, but actually the same view that the guest sees, the virtual machine sees. Okay, so it's just a raw disk. So in, in this implementation, what we did was um, we basically assumed that there's a virtual appliance for the backup vendor, and we attach a point in time, but which is writable to the uh, to the backup uh, um, to the virtual plants. And then you do snapshot addition to commit back to the no, to, oh, you, not you yet. The snapshot around. For now, yes. Well, there, there are actually two snapshots there. One is we we create a QCOW layer, and then we uh, give another QCOW on top of that, which is transient only for that vert appliance, so it would be able to mount and do things which actually change data. But the one in the middle remains. Yeah, for now. We will, in the end, we have a bullet about live merge. Um, that's a, a feature that many customers want, and we want to push it in as soon as possible. So I think the number one question after seeing this topic is this is an API <coughs> allows us to do backup with third parties. What about internal, right? I, I wanted the full solution, the hypervisor level. If you look at the equivalent in the uh, commodity world where VMware, VMware has their VATP uh, solution that uh, actually allows a lot of vendors uh, uh, to do just this. Uh, uh, and then in the last releases of 5.1, 5.5, they actually included their own built-in uh, 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 backup based on a VM. Same, same, same topology as the vendors are doing. Uh, uh, but as a VM. So well, I think one of the things that we'll see uh, and we want to see is uh, uh, getting over it to actually be self-contained and allow actually to allow all customers, regardless of third parties, being able to do backup more and more. Right? So that's a longer term, but I think it's a good starting point. Any question before we jump to the next one? Yes? Keeping snapshots around for a longer time can be a performance issue. <laughs> Are you looking into that or giving recommendations? How That's one of the key things when we looked at this feature. Uh, and I think that the key word that Yal mentioned is the transient disk. The transient by, by its uh, essence is it's going after a temporary. Uh, uh, and the, the way we actually do it, and this is also yeah, have something to do with what Yal just mentioned, about being able to do live merge and get rid of the temporary snapshot. So this is absolutely on our plate. and, and, and and part of this feature uh, uh, when you look at it. Yeah, right now, Overt supports uh, cold merge and live merge. The next, one of the next big things that's hot on our roadmap. It's clear that it's, you know, for to really, when uh, in the in long term view, you really have to get rid of layers at some point. Uh, so clearly, we'll, we'll do that. I'm guessing, well, most likely in the next year, we should either next version or the version after that, but don't catch me by my work, right? So there is another new feature in at the QM level that is a point-in-time backup. Mm -hmm. So it is like a uh, snapshot. It can be atomic for multiple disks and so on. But uh, it, instead of... Uh, it reverses. So yeah, exactly. So it writes the point-in-time mm -hmm. backup to a new image. Yeah. And the guest keeps writing on the yes. other one. And this is nice because when you are done, you can just delete the file. Uh, and uh, you can decide whether to make it based on the QCA um, images below or to do a full conversion to O in case it's not an appliance. It's something yeah. that we so, have for. So actually, what we need from QMU and working with the QMU community uh, on that is not just that, but actually change block tracking. To really uh, enable um, <coughs> incremental backups and not have the backup uh, vendor have to introspect the disk in order to understand what what's changed, uh, just an API that will notify the backup uh, software 
these are the blocks that have changed since the last time you uh, backed up. Well, or alternatively, these are the blocks that are located in any of the top three snapshots. Yeah. If you, yes. I mean, if I if I backed up, for, if I'm backing up relative to snapshot two, I, I do incremental backups. I create a new snapshot mm -hmm. every week, every month, yep. and delete them when it's the new the retention policy. Uh, uh, assuming, yeah. but that's only assuming you still have that snapshot. If I merged it because I get, want to get rid of snapshots, then I don't have that. <coughs> I, I only need the last two. I need I mean, yeah. the one from yesterday, the one from today, yeah. and the one from the so, beginning of the yeah. month. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one way to go. But if you look at the broader spec of what oh, customers yeah. are doing today, so customers are actually already using CDP, uh, for example. And this is why we would like to see it coming for my course and provide incremental backups as well. Um, Wait, so yeah. Mike, you had a question? It's somewhat related to disaster recovery, but you might be talking about it later. Mm -hmm. uh, Storage domain recovery events for the last engine. We're talking about it later. OK, that's fine. <laughs> um, OK, another thing in, under the umbrella of disaster recovery is dynamic storage connection. And, and this is a big thing for us because it sounds trivial. Uh, uh, it basically let you deal better with like uh, friendly names or uh, multipathing. But in a nutshell, it allows us actually to fill the gap where it needs to uh, uh, be able to change mon IDs or if you're using any replication in the back end. And, and I think till now, if customers wanted to actually use over to do it, they had to do some all kinds of tweaks you know, to get it. What we did is actually brought it into the front door. Uh, so customer will be able to enable. By the way, all of this, uh, 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 all of these capabilities exist today in free. In free, free. Okay, so yeah. you can just click on this. Uh, uh, if you download the presentation, just click. You just go to the wiki page of each one of these features. Okay, so you have a full spec. Um, this management, um, basic stuff, right? Be able to on online resize a disk. Right now, we're just increasing it. We haven't dealt yet with the shrinking part. Uh, uh, it's more tricky. <laughs> but at least we got this in. This is, by the way, we did a uh, community server uh, a few weeks back. And DR and this resize were probably the two ones that are we see most common. And I'm glad that we made it and into this release. Uh, Bridge is SCSI support. So uh, we have limitations today. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, uh, Virtuous SCSI right now is coexist in this version. Looking forward, we might be able to do everything in uh, Virtuous SCSI because it's much more robust. Uh, um, yeah, so, yeah. so Virtuous SCSI is relatively new uh, in QMU, so we, don't, we haven't made it the default yet because uh, we want to, uh, to make sure that the code is uh, stable underneath uh, once that happens. Uh, looks like Vert.io SCSI is the way to go for all disk interfaces in uh, in uh, QMU. Uh, but Paolo may have something to say about that. No, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's not really not just because it's, it, it may be ready to become the default uh, in, in 3.4, but in 3.3, I mean, let people play with it. Because yeah. <laughs> this is this is what's the idea. Yeah. We added it in, <laughs> complicated. It, so, uh. No, actually, my question was, uh, if you have uh, a direct LAN uh, uh, disk. So I don't know exactly the over te te terminology, but <coughs> I can try. So if you have a direct LAN disk, are you exposing it uh, as emulated or as passed? So let's say you have a, you know, a disk from Vendor X. Does the guest see QMU or does it see Vendor X? Because the, uh, most of the storage uh, enhancement requests that arrive down to QMU for about uh, discard, basically. Mm -hmm. And you get that for free, basically, if you do pesto and the guest can just send uh, a discard command that goes all the way down to the. So uh, the, the user can choose what interface to use ID, Ferdio block, Ferdio SCSI. And if they choose Ferdio SCSI, it would. It is uh, faster. So if you take your SCSI, um, they're inclined, they're inclined, I will, it's always what, faster. faster. Uh, well, no. no. So Vertio SCSI pass-through requires elevated uh, permissions. No. Um, you are able to run some uh, 
you are able to do more things on the storage than a normal user is able to. So in those cases, in overt, a user has to have a specific role in order to be able to do that. Uh, but, but you're not able to do anything more really unless QRM would set parts with the different information. No, but there are SCSI commands that you can run which are problematic, if I recall correctly. They, are, they should be forbidden by, Q, by the kernel at the QM level. So uh, unless you pass the libvirt uh, parameter to enable it. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's configurable. And other, other than that, it's path through. OK. So the, the whole only uh, change is well, whether, whether they are enabled or not, but yes. it's always path through. Yes. Okay. You cannot have that plan related. I don't believe we do that unless you use virtio block. Yes. So maybe that could be a little bit of a block unless you have an alternative. If you haven't got it yet, we would like you to start playing with it, right? In order for you to make it through the 3.4 uh, as a nature, we need to, uh, community, start testing this, this new features, right? This is, this is uh, we're, we're adding uh, new capabilities that actually unlock the gaps that we used to have till now, and I think that's a good thing. So uh, uh, I encourage you actually to download 3.3 beta and stuff like that. Uh, and, and open box if they're any. Um, this block alignment is also basic functionality in my <laughs> uh, uh, perception, and I think now we added the ability to scan and at least uh, be able to have the tools to the administrator to be able to take. Yeah, uh, from the GUI. So um, uh, community user named John from NetApp opened this RFP. Sits in this room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, John. Thank you. So. Uh, 3.3 has the ability uh, to scan. You can uh, scan any disk uh, for to, to make sure that it's uh, properly aligned. Uh, and if not, right now, you'll have to <coughs> fix this manually. But the implications of a misaligned disk are uh, horrendous performance, which can easily be fixed. So 40% yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. So we want to at least let the user know that, hey, you have a, an easy way to really get much better performance uh, just by doing something within the guest. And, and just, to, just to be clear, uh, uh, RHEL 6 and beyond and the uh, corresponding Fedora release, you're fine. Yeah, and it's this, always this is something that, that you need to be concerned with for oh, RHEL 5 and earlier. Yeah. Um, the force is Windows XP. Yeah. Yeah. First use uh, Windows. <laughs> I believe it's 2003 and beyond. You're okay. Yeah. Uh, prior to prior that. To that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so right now it's a button you need to push on the next to the disk if you want to scan it. Um, I discussed this earlier with Federico actually. So. If we limit ourselves to live, we can actually um, peek when the QMU allows us to peek at the uh, at uh, blocks uh, from the inside of the guest. So in that case, we'll be able to do it with get VM stats. So basically, uh, while the VM is running, we'd be able to once, let's say, every 10 minutes or uh, an hour or whatever, once in a blue moon, doesn't matter, peek automatically and propagate this back to the engine. Yeah, and just, I mean, you, you can check it once, and you'll never have to check it again. Well, you're, the, the idea is that yeah. you're, you're starting to the partition. Yeah. Unless, unless you re reinstall your machine. Yeah, and then it's re So that's why that's you, true. let's say, especially for a new machine, so you're, yes, you'll need to. Scan it after first boot, then scan it once a month or something. Like well, no, after first boot is not good enough because that's before you install it and you yeah. haven't defined yeah. your petitions yet. And then first boot after you open the first So, in general, it costs very little. So, Sorry. yeah. So, um, we have actual implementation. Then are we going to get into GEM for this, or are we using? No, Guest right now, right now we're using libguestfs. Okay. Uh, so we're putting libguest libguestfs into Node as well and things like that. Well. We were already pulling it. Oh, OK. Um, do we have any other features plan then around that tool set? It is quite a big tool um, set. So, so yes. Um, well, fantasy side of things, we've had lots of nice, cool, really cool features planned to be to use with the libguestfs. 
be able to see the file tree uh, of disks from the GUI, be able to copy a file from inside the, the guest disk to, to the user side, assuming, of course, you have the proper permissions because you don't want to allow that to anyone. Um, things like uh, uh, resparsifying a file, so you want to reclaim a lot of storage that is wasteful. But that's a very lengthy process, but if you need the storage space, so there are lots of things that we could do with LibGuestFS. Um, if someone from the community were to start looking in that direction, we would give you know all the all the guidance we can. Um, our priorities are mostly driven by the company that is paying us, so we're pushing uh, the the order in which we're pushing features depends on uh, on that, but. We'd love to see those things. It'd be good for disk resize, too, because I'm assuming the current feature does not handle the uh, guest, guest size. The guest disk yeah, 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 that's a great uh, well, no, so, uh, or, a, or a guest integration into the guest agent. And, uh, and, uh, so the guest agent can already do specifying. QMU guest agent? Yeah. OK, that's, uh, that's good to know. Yeah. OK, um, the next one is this hooks. It basically allows us to do a, a hook injection uh, uh, when we do a hot plug and unplug with disks. Uh, uh, the hot plug disk actually uh, came in uh, an earlier version. This time, we actually added uh, this feature as well because we added an app for it, and it makes sense. Um, yeah. OK. This is. We're done with refresh screen. We're starting to look ahead. And um, uh, what we try to bring is some of the areas we uh, start to see. Uh, and uh, the number one, actually, the uh, buzzword compliant of software defined storage. Long before it was called that way, we already started to do it. Right? Uh, that's what. Uh, Dep depends on the definition. Yes, depends on the yeah. definition. Uh, um, so in 3.3, uh, well, uh, as you know, in 3.3, uh, two, we added the cluster. Uh, we had the, the support that's POSIX. Uh, in Frequent Free, we actually can create today um, um, already a native storage domain of cluster. Uh, and we have actually a tighter integration in the, in the management, in, your, in the overhead manager, uh, uh, to allows you actually to uh, right click and, and see your breaks and, and all the other different management things you can do. Uh, in cluster, you can actually do it natively already in over 3.3. That's a big step. And um, this actually brings me to the second uh, one, uh, a new trend that we're seeing also from, uh, I mentioned VMware earlier. VMware just came up to the market with what they call vSAN. It's a converged hypervisor and software-defined storage together uh, in a SAN. <laughs> uh, uh, what we're looking at is actually 3.3 already has that uh, uh, one uh, foot already in that direction, is actually to do it in a cloud level cluster as uh, so uh, and the way we were looking at today, uh, there was earlier talk today about hosted engine. Uh, those are the, you know, and hosted engine concept basically takes the engine, which was still not physical, and yeah, make it available as a virtual machine within uh, um, the hypervisor. Uh, this actually opens the door for us uh, uh, to look at more cool ways to do things and not just necessarily put the engine there, right? So we heard it earlier talk about the backup API with virtual appliance that does backup. We can look at that from a different perspective and uh, apply different policies. Uh, and the way we'd like to see this is not just uh, uh, go and kick out the redundant hardware because you don't need a specific server just for the hardware because they're in the story, uh, but also what will be the right place to place the cluster. Uh, uh, inside, right? It can be a VM, and what will be the right path? Also, an angle we're looking at is also from a management perspective, unified management, right? So the, the, when we talk about converge, <coughs> this is the things we're, we're looking ahead. So it will have a, a, a commodity hardware that can scale up and scale out, right? So you can have a building blocks, cloud-oriented already, right? Uh, and, and that's the key. This is what we would like to drive in for over the project. From a, from a technical perspective, so we already create we already provision cluster and consume cluster. Um, what we're lacking in order to really work well is uh, is a co-located storage and uh, hypervisor. 
is scheduling logic that will schedule virtual machines where the data lies to reduce uh, load on the network, uh, and possibly uh, some advanced uh, storage network features, integration with the Neutron or other SDNs that will uh, make sure quality of service for the storage replication and things like that. Um, questions on this? Uh, yeah, with the cluster integration, yep. are we anywhere near in the future actually planning to integrate the uh, management of the cluster on level of uh, being able to call healing from over or this kind of stuff? So, interesting question. Um, Today, for those of you who don't know, overt is not just uh, um, virtualization, enterprise virtualization management platform, but it also serves as the Gluster management console. So it uh, provisions Gluster. It uh, can rebalance and do all kinds of advanced uh, features in Gluster. Um, the Gluster community is actually driving that forward. And they are adding uh, more and more features there. They do want it to be the, uh, the, the main console for managing it. So they, the idea is to cover the entire feature set of Luster. Healing is uh, yeah. part of that. But more. Also. OK, so we're done with that section. We're going to talk about now storage offloading capabilities, and then we're going to uh, just quickly go on different projects and where we are and where you see them coming to play. Um, want to start? Sure. So how many people here uh, understand what, what I mean by storage offloading? OK. So I'll start with covering that first. Um, today, sorry? Did you ask positively or negatively? I just wanted to understand uh, if I need to go into, first give an explanation of what that is before I dive into how we do it. Um, so today in Overt, all the storage uh, we do is storage virtualization. That means that Overt itself is providing uh, snapshots capabilities, thin provisioning over QCAL, et cetera. We're not leveraging storage array capabilities like uh, snapshots on the storage side, like uh, the, like uh, provisioning of LANs and uh, things like that. Storage offloading is basically taking that next step and doing that. Okay, so going to the storage side of things, and instead of creating a QCAL snapshot which has performance implications or limitations on the number of snapshots, if I have a storage array that can linearly scale, I'd rather use the capabilities on the storage array. If I can uh, provision a LAN as a virtual disk on the fly, because my storage array can do that and scale to 10 to 10,000 disks or more, and then I can define policies on the storage side like replication per LAN, which is the granularity that storage arrays usually work on when they're block based or per file if it's a if it's a, a file based um, storage array. So that's what I'm talking about when uh, when saying storage offloading. Um, we, what we do not want to do is start adding code that integrates specifically with NetApp, with EMC, with Hitachi. That doesn't scale and doesn't make much sense. Um, I think a year and a half or two years ago, we started a, a work with uh, another group on defining a project that would give us that abstraction layer. So we defined an API that says this is how you offload to the storage, and that layer would have plugins that know how to speak to each, uh, each specific vendor. Um, what came out of that was a project uh, called Lib Storage Management. Um, it's, a Linux, um, <coughs> it's a Linux project. It's, uh, it can be used by not only Overt, by, but by anyone else. Um, we have their integrations with uh, with NetApp, with uh, LIO, uh, EMC, if I'm uh, if I recall correctly, and we're talking to more vendors to to do more integrations there. Um, so one option we have in order to get storage offloading in Overt is integrating directly with Lib Storage Management. Um, it makes a lot of sense. It's uh, the current. 
fits with our current module model where we integrate with Linux uh, Linux um, packages. So LVM, iSCSI, yeah. Tils, etc. It's it's another it's another package, another library in Linux that we can use. Um, while we were doing this, actually, uh, another project was uh, coming up and uh, becoming uh, prominent, and that was Cinder in OpenStack. Um, Cinder basically does uh, something similar. So it has plugins to different vendors, and it gives uh, a single API that you can use to provision storage. Um, and what we're doing there is actually we're introducing in Cinder a driver for lib storage management. Uh, so probably what we want to do in Overt, but we're open for suggestions, for other suggestions, is integrate with Cinder and by having the lib storage management driver enjoy both worlds. Um, so by the way, uh, the Cinder already has a very large uh, ecosystem. Uh, uh, so uh, we th by actually enjoying the world, and we're actually uh, taking over the proven technology that works and and be able to right. deliver it to over right. So instead of reinventing the wheel, you would like. Yes. On, on top of that, on, you know, on top of being able to just take advantage of everything that Cinder has to mm -hmm. offer, find a lot of companies such as that that, that you know create drivers specifically for Cinder. So that's another. Right. Easy. That's the idea. That, that, this is exactly what I refer. So, so, so. The, the difference is that Cinder requires requires you to set up another server or another uh, another service, whereas lib storage management can be done directly from a hypervisor to the storage. Um, so there is some added complexity uh, in the architecture there. Um, it also may mean that we'd like to provision Cinder from uh, overt. If, if that's where we're going. So there are benefits to doing a direct integration with LibSM, um, benefits to doing uh, integration with, uh, with uh, Cinder. Uh, from, a, from a vendor perspective, once we'll have the LibSM driver, it makes a lot more sense to integrate with LibSM because that can be leveraged, again, from a pure Linux uh, uh, level without going to a, an external service, and when you need when you need to scale out, then you can set up your Cinder service and just do it that way. So um, again, we're not we're not uh, conclusive about which direction we'll choose. No, I, I think the important thing is there, there's options. Yeah, yeah. Uh, options are good. Yeah, definitely, and we may end up seeing both. So just to close, uh, Sam, as you mentioned, is already in the Linux, right? It's going to be part of the Linux. Uh, uh, and this is on the guest name side. Cinder is actually in uh, the cloud management. So in combining the two worlds, yeah, we actually open the bridge for customer to start maybe with a certain deployment and be able to go up to the cloud OS. And, and this is where the OpenStack integration, it's not just right. about Cinder, right? We're looking at different. Uh, 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 services being integrated. One of the things uh, that I'll mention going forward is what we already done today in 3.3, uh, integrating LAMA service, right? So being able to integrate with the uh, key services of OpenStack actually allow customers, when they want, be able to move on to the uh, cloud stack. Uh, uh, and that's one of the uh, fruits of uh, playing in the two uh, worlds. So would it make sense to, to interest to integrate Cinder even at the lower level and have a libvirt to, to Cinder to man so that uh, libvirt can get information from Cinder about where the uh, images are and uh, basically so that also that goes all the way up then I mean you can have VDSM and Nova that's talk that, to Libert yeah. in Cinder terms and Libert goes to Cinder. That's an interesting question. Um, that very possibly, we need to, to sit down and think about the architecture there. The immediate things that uh, uh, come, at, come at me is the fact that today, the way Opert work, it works is first it creates the objects, it's decide, it decides what 
the names of the objects will be, etc., and then it passes them to Libvirt or to the underlying layers. Um, but I don't see that as a, you know as, as a reason not to to be doing the, this. Um, it makes some things uh, much clearer. So go to Libvirt, create a live snapshot. It would do create all the containers it needs on sender, etc. There is a question of uh, scalability there because that means that instead of one entity talking to sender, let's say the engine, now we have uh, 100 or 200 uh, nodes uh, all uh, contacting it. But but again, we need to review that. That's an interesting because question. Because Libert could decide to create a snapshot uh, to QM or to Cinder. Yeah. yeah. So. Federico is probably the guy who would be leading that effort. So <laughs> he's sitting just next to you, so <laughs> he's asking apparently. So yeah, we, <laughs> we just bring the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nice, nice comment. Thanks. Okay. Uh, before we jump, so yeah. the next topic we uh, wanted to highlight and start the discussion maybe was the high performance. And and what we've seen is that when it comes to hypervisor, at the end of the game, it's all random because uh, this is what you end up with. And we're looking at how we can better utilize the new uh, backend, such so as solid state, uh, not just array of cards, et cetera, and, and make better placement decisions. Uh, so, yeah, yeah from, from, a, from a low level point of view, so today, even if you have a virtual machine that is performing fully sequential I.O. right uh, to disks, because you're running 100 virtual machines on the same uh, host, and you have an I.O. scheduler, it end up, ends up all being random I.O. no matter what you do, basically. Um, now, random I.O. is bad for SSDs. Uh, they're now working, in order to increase capacity, they're working on a, a shingled uh, magnetic drives. That's the SMR technology, um, which in SMR case, you have to have all I.O. be sequential. And SSDs, if you really want to reach the best performance, you need to write your I.O. sequentially. Um, so what we're starting to look at is actually adding a uh, logging device underneath all the virtual machines. So to sequentialize all right IOs, uh, possibly either on top or underneath LVM, we're not, uh, <coughs> we'll need to check that out. Um, that, that's great for right, for right IO. Uh, that, but by definition, that means that all read IO is now degraded to random. Um, but it's in any event probably already degraded to random because in today's machines people are, re are uh, running 200 uh, virtual machines and more. Uh, so even if you're using deadline, yes, John. So I, I just want to throw in there. Uh, you know, many, many of the, the enterprise storage vendors out there help out with that by having you know, some kind of a flash cache acceleration on right. the front end of the storage. Yes. It really helps with that. Uh, and most of us are also developing uh, that, that uh, flash acceleration from a software standpoint closer to the hypervisor, closer to the virtual machine. Yep. So, so there's there's other ways to solve that problem. Definitely. Uh, okay. And then the other the other thing with the SSD, you're absolutely right. There's there's ways that you can use it. There's there's some very complex algorithms that are being developed to overcome uh, the shelf life of the individual components of, of the solid, the uh, you know, non-rotational media. Uh, but that's another you know uh, tiered tiered placement of your storage. Right. And just have your application data hammer away at the SSD, uh, and just let your let your hypervisors and your your boot disks um, you know use the old stuff. Yes. You know. So it's the thing is, it's uh, quite complicated to start managing that if it's not done automatically for uh, you um, from an overt perspective. So we don't only support uh, um, high-end uh, storage from uh, from distinguished vendors, but also uh, local disks, um, uh, lower JBODs, etc. Uh, so we need to get to a common den denominator that. What, what, our, what we aspire to is to get the best performance on any type of storage and then get the even better performance on high-end uh, storage. Yes? Does Bcache play a role in this? Bcache? Any new kernels? 
caching algorithms. Device mapper thing. Which does what? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's also DM cache. It's another very yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's yeah. Yeah. So we're all so, yeah. so the question with caching though at the hypervisor level is that you, your storage if, if in the case of crash of a of your host, you lose data. Now today when we run virtual machines, all our I.O. is direct I.O. We don't go through the page cache at all. Right? We generally shy away from caches on the host level. We'd like the storage to do caching when it has it. Um, it depends on what your uh, requirements are and how uh, how uh, sensitive <coughs> you are to data loss. So we are one thing that I did mention is that we are going to add some um, configuration uh, ability to configure basically what type of caching you want to use for virtual machine yeah. for disk. But the default will always be a safe option. Why do you say that you lose data? I mean, it's the cache. It's still an volatile. Yes, but. My host crashed. Let's say it's an HA host. Uh, I'm run. My host crashed. 200 virtual machines just died. Now I uh, I have a critical production service there. I will automatically run that virtual machine on a ah, different but you host. Lose the data then because it's local. But the yeah. data is local yeah. to that first yeah. host. Now that virtual machine already recovered from crash, changed the data on disk. That data is stale. It's dead. Okay. Irrelevant. So even if it's persistent cache on a single host level. A virtual machine is something that moves around yeah. uh, within a cluster. So I, that, that cache is pretty bad for me, actually. It can give me false guarantees. It doesn't false guarantees. That mean that you place the cache in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the point. Yeah. But there, there are definitely use cases, right? So you have um, pinned, pinned uh, virtual machines, virtual machines that you want to run only on this host. Terrific yeah. having a, a DM cache in that case boosts performance, um, persistent, no problem. But in the general use case, that's not where we were aiming at. Okay. Okay. So we're more questions before yeah. we proceed. We have more topics to cover, so let's not. No, we... this is good discussion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, replication. Uh, we talked about the, the beginning of the slides of DR, having backup, having uh, be able to uh, utilize actually uh, array replication. I, I mentioned that people would be actually bridge that gap. Uh, uh, so well, this is where we are today. And since we are today, we're already looking ahead, right? Uh, 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 and uh, the next thing when it comes to mind, of course, is looking at distributed uh, geo replication. Uh, and we're not trying to solve things just for one data center, but uh, multiple. And looking also, uh, what will it take for us to do it at a hypervisor level? Uh, there are some solutions out there today in the market for commercial products that actually uh, be able to do the replication on the VM level itself, regardless of the array. Uh, it's a more software solution, and we're looking at all the different aspects. Uh, what will it take? And of course, we mentioned earlier the Cinder and consumption. Now we'll look at Cinder, uh, how we can play into here. So you want to start? When sure. So it's not just Cinder, but um, so actually, the, we approach this not from an open perspective, from, but rather from an open stack perspective, looking at DR and the cloud. Um, and that's why Sean mentioned Cinder, and I'll get back to that. Basically, we see um, three types of storage replication. You have your high-end storage arrays, which you can configure uh, with synchronous or asynchronous replication to a remote site, depending on the latency and how much money you're willing to put on the infrastructure. Um, then you have. Uh, File system, distributed file systems that give you uh, replication or distributed storage. So DRVD for block devices, Ceph, uh, which is kind of in the middle, and uh, Gluster, which is totally file-based. They all have uh, replication capabilities today. So you can set up either, let's say, a DRVD target, which, which is replicating to a remote site. Um, so you can get replication that way. And the third type is hypervisor-based uh, replication. Basically have QMU replicate uh, asynchronously to a remote uh, uh, node. 
so these are the three types of replications we, we see. We'd like to add such capabilities uh, inherent to uh, overt. Um, QMUK VM based is, uh, is probably the most agnostic to anything you use. So it should uh, work, but then it's not necessarily uh, from a performance perspective or from other perspectives the best option you'd like to use. Um, so it's, <coughs> it's, it's once it's there, it's probably the uh, default option, but not the high-end option. Um, DRBD, Ceph, and Gluster. So uh, if you have a distributed uh, file system like that or a dis distributed block device, then you can uh, set that up and get it, and obviously the most uh, confined from a configuration perspective. So Gluster, I can set up GR replication on the fly, right? I have two Gluster setups. It assumes that I have two Gluster clusters, uh, one local, one remote, and I can just send a software com command, please set up this uh, connection from, from within Overt, for example, set it up, and then just start uh, replicating at the volume level. Um, Storage arrays, normally uh, an administrator would have to go configure, have to have two storage arrays which are capable of it, configure it, and run, but it probably would provide the best uh, uh, performance and, um, and it's probably the most <coughs> robust nowadays because it's been there for the, the longest. Do you know if there is already the capability in the storage management? For setting up replication, yeah. there is not. Okay. Um, so the reason Cinder is here is because actually next week is uh, Ice House Summit, OpenStack Summit, uh, and we're going to propose uh, replication as a service into Cinder, uh, and we'd like actually to define the API that allows. Um, setting up the replication and um, and starting a replication at a volume level, not a storage side volume, but a, a LUN level, basically, or a file, file level replication. Um, we would like to have all three options, but we'll probably start uh, in a crawl, walk, run uh, model. We'll start with a storage array-based replication because that already exists uh, at customer sites. Um, so, from an overt perspective, integrating with Cinder would give that would give us that for free. So it's probably again another reason why we'd like to integrate with Cinder. So for the hypervisor based one, mm -hmm. uh, we have a guy in Red Hat. His name is Paolo, and he's yes. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants something that doesn't work? But uh, has the same API as the one that should work. Okay. <laughs> so basically, it's up to the Libre guy to integrate it, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the meanwhile, so someone else will rewrite it to make it actually work and support uh, a replication of uh, atomic, atomically of multiple disks, and you get an atomic view. Of, it's not, of course, the replication wherever you stop it, uh, it must still be a point of time, you don't know which point of time, but it's one point of time. Uh, a consistent of, view of yeah, your disks, exactly, otherwise yeah. if they're not exactly uh, at the same time, not ordered, then you can it's play with freeze and thaw to, yeah. to make it less bad, but still uh, it's better to handle it at the hypervisor level directly, and this is not there. And also the change of tagging would also help, because otherwise mm -hmm. if QM crashes, you have to start replicating yeah. from scratch. Right. So all this is not there, uh, but uh, uh, apart from the change block tracking, the API is there. So Livlet can start integrating it. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to understand what is the API for uh, the replication side. I mean, yeah. for the replication side, if they want to, if you just want to put it somewhere on uh, iSCSI LAN, you just pass the device and it's copied there. But if it is, um, so it's probably it's so if you want to have like, things like the duplication or something like that. Basically, you need to have something in the middle that reads the replication data, yeah. 
And you need to, uh, to, uh, to agree on two things. One is the API, and there's nothing to agree because we decided it's NBD, and you, yeah. <laughs> and you adapt. <laughs> and <laughs> the second part, uh, that's the important part, is the authentication and authorization of who actually can read the replication. So let's see about the first part. <laughs> um, so Overt is an enterprise virtualization management system. That means that although from a QMU perspective we're replicating a single virtual machine, multiple disks within a single virtual machine, from an enterprise perspective, I don't want to replicate one. I want to replicate 100. Having 100 connections across, the, uh, across two sites doesn't really scale. Um, you want to do all kinds of manipulations there. You want to uh, compress the data. You want to dedupe. You want to do all kinds of advanced things. So probably we'd like a gateway. Exactly. That's why uh, NBD has a gateway or whatever. But. So definitely we'd like to define a gateway. We'd like to be able to do all these advanced capabilities on it. Uh, that is probably stuff for a separate project, in fact. Right? Not, not um, over. In overt, we'd love to consume that. Cinder stuff. Um, Cinder, Cinder is a storage API. It does not give advanced capabilities. It exposes them. So it's a shim layer. Um, no, yeah, I mean, it's other Cinder consumers and uh, yeah. Yeah. So we, we need to, to model that and see what is that component that can accept all these connections, can uh, uh, run all these advanced capabilities on. Um, possibly there, the, yesterday's discussion about deduplication, if that's the target. Yeah where we do it, then possibly there it's an interesting use case. So there's, so what they want to do is basically, this guy has a customer that basically, wants to create is the a guy filer. still there paying too much money to make up? <laughs> <laughs> so they want to get rid of the expensive sun and replace it with just JBOD uh, and whatever. Yeah. And so they have Quorum, uh, they have, uh, they want basically to, they do the device mapper in QMU so that they can stop having uh, expensive storage. Yeah. Which is uh, a debatable uh, approach. It's reinventing the wheel. In exactly. Yeah. I mean, there are some cases in but which QMU sorry. really has yeah. to reinvent the wheel, but I yeah. guess I don't I'm sorry to cut you off, Paolo, but uh, I'd like to focus on over storage aspects. No, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is that uh, basically something like Cinder. Yep. It's something that it would be great to integrate at all levels from QM up to the top because. Thank you for yeah. saying that. So I, I just want to capture, and we have only a few minutes, and we just want to give you also a glimpse of 3.4. So uh, in terms of integration for we already discussed uh, uh, where we are with OpenStack today. So 3.3, that is out. Feel free to download it and start integrating and play with Glance. Glance gives you the ability to actually take even a golden image from your data center be able to export it to OpenStack and, and uh, uh, go through that bridge I mentioned earlier. It also works backwards. You can uh, export uh, an image from uh, OpenStack that the original maybe other hypervisor even and bring it into uh, uh, over. That's a great capability. Uh, I'm glad that we've made it in. The guy that actually that done it uh, uh, beautifully is sitting in this room. Uh, thank you, Federico. <laughs> And uh, going forward, uh, uh, we would like uh, not just to consume Cinder, as you saw, we, we talked in different angles about the consumption, but also be able to provide. Um, to, just, just to explain what uh, provide means, it means write a uh, driver for Cinder uh, on top of uh, Overt storage. So today in Overt, we have a unique uh, solution for um, clustering LVM in a way that we can scale to hundreds of nodes. We've actually tested it with 200 physical nodes accessing the same uh, virtual group. Um, and being able to provide that and, and, and contribute back also to the OpenStack community, but also have a single API in over that we work against, which is Cinder, and consume even our storage in this way um, simplifies a lot of things. So. That's uh, another direction we'd like uh, to go in. Um, again, I'd love to hear feedback on, on these ideas. Right, uh, 
that this is the point of the of the buff. So yeah. you can um, you can influence where we we're taking things. Okay. Okay. Um, API. So uh, it's pretty until we open the door that you have the uh, third party uh, UI plugins. And, and I mentioned here uh, the example of NetApp actually uh, did their, their VCS 1.0 integration. And it works beautifully because you can go into the over it and do all the management stuff uh, from one place, right? Uh, uh, so it does only make sense and encourage other vendors to, uh, uh, in the community, uh, do the same and start integrating. Uh, what we are also looking to expand is the next generation of the backup API. Uh, one of the cool things that happening uh, in the uh, uh, guest layer, so in QMOJ, for example, will uh, will support soon. The patch is already there. Uh, VSS. VSS is the Microsoft Shared Copy service that allows you to do consistent snapshot uh, of the application. So it cohesions the application. The application has writers, and it allows you to basically do a consistent snapshot, not just scratch consistent. But application was consistent. So if you can combine this with the DR capabilities we mentioned earlier, replication, that sometimes replication just copy as well the payload of a virus, right? So in this case, you'll be able to actually restore from a good known point uh, at the application level. So uh, and of course we do it also with Linux. Linux doesn't have VSS, but we do have other uh, uh, methodologies uh, we need to at the freeze uh, at the fast system uh, level. And so this is coming up in the uh, next versions of the backup API. And of course, we already talked about CBT. And that's another requirement uh, to do incremental. Yeah. Also, yeah. So also interesting is uh, other vendors that have integrated with Overt. Um, part of the uh, connection management for DR, uh, so that was to avoid having to have the DB uh, in order to, re to recover on our remote site. Mm -hmm. um, Symantec is uh, making use of that, uh, and they uh, actually have a product which is uh, managing disaster recover of an entire overt uh, environment. So you can, if, assuming you have storage replication going on of your storage, you can recover with one push of a button an entire uh, setup. So uh, the, the Symantec Storage Foundation 6.1 data is out. Uh, it actually includes this plugin. Uh, and you can actually, it's similar to my, to VMware's SRM. Uh, it, it, it deals with the whole workflow management when you have to resemble a, a slight failure. Uh, so that's also another gap that we're closing in terms of disaster recovery. And, and this is already frequent free stuff. Lastly, uh, we're looking at uh, the next version, 3.4, things that we have listed that uh, we heard from the community and from customers. Mm -hmm. Immediate uh, pain points. Yes. It's not get rid of storage domain, it's get rid of storage pool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, not the domain right. itself. We still need the data. Yeah, um, yeah so I'll, I'll briefly go over the list, and then we can dive with the rest of the time we have into anyone, anything you'd like. Um, so we'd like to, today, we have a single metadata writer in the, in the um, data center. Uh, this is denoted as the SVM. It's, uh, point of pain for a long time. Uh, we are now at a point where we're we're going to we, we are going to upload a wiki that uh, describes the art the suggested architecture, how we'd like to get rid of this and basically enable any node to perform operations but keep the scalability that we have today. Um, and that should get rid of the SPM, the master domain reinitialize data center, all kinds of error flow uh, recovery flows that we have, which will just stop existing and improve robustness of overt. Um, so we'd really like to see that. That's uh, probably in my personal list. That's uh, the top item. It would also enable to mix and match storage types freely. Yeah. So uh, iSCSI and NFS and, and other arbitrary limitations that we have today just Get rid of them finally. Um, uh, iSCSI multipathing. So, if you were uh, yesterday in the uh, Keele University session, so today we don't manually set up or we don't explicitly set up iSCSI connection over multiple NICs. We just let iSCSI util uh, do, do its thing and it does not set up multipathing properly. 
Um, so we want to add that. That's basically a knit. In fact, in VDSM, we already support it. It's just uh, close the gap on the engine side and expose it to the user. So uh, we'd be able to, to solve that. Um, Import existing storage domain actually conflicts with getting rid of the storage <coughs> pool, at least for V1. Um, there, we, we are in debates about uh, the, the solution we'd like, the way we'd like to support it. So the use case, as I see it, is I have my storage, and my, uh, my uh, over setup crashed and died. I want now to be able to, to recover just from the storage and, and get back up and running. Um, one suggestion which will leave us enough time to actually focus on getting rid of the storage pool is to, in fact, store the virtual machine configurations in Swift or in a similar object storage. Um, the other alternative, which is to some people more appealing but would be Significantly, significantly more complex and not necessarily more correct would be to store the configurations on a on the storage domain where the virtual machines are. Thing is, uh, the virtual disks are. The thing is, a virtual machine can have disks that span multiple storage domains. Um, so, I'm personally I'm trying to push towards uh, towards integrating with Swift and or with any uh, S3 API and uh, and get there. We'll see what what the uh, engineers decide at the end, because they always do it <laughs> at the uh, end of the day. Um, single disk snapshots. So today in Overt, when you create a snapshot, you create a snapshot of an entire virtual machine. Um, Overt does not know really how to handle a case where uh, I managed to create a snapshot of a single disk, but uh, for another disk, I, I was not able to manage it. Uh, we reach a state where uh, the user sees this disk is broken or something like that, and you need to take some steps in order to recover from that. Um, single disk snapshots is the capability of taking a, a snapshot also of a single disk. And it solves two things. First of all, it's a, it's a new capability. And the other thing is that it, um, it uh, eliminates the problems or the error handling in case of a full VM snapshot going bad. OK, so it simplifies things there. Um, Read-only disk, uh, so that's <coughs> basically a knit. It's, uh, the patches are already upstream. Um, it's the ability to expose a virtual disk as read-only to a guest. Uh, there can be lots of use cases. Let's say I have a LUN. I don't want the guest to touch it, but uh, I want it to be able to read the data off of it. Um, one such, uh, one such application is uh, Manage IQ, which uh, polices disks. It goes through, uh, through them and uh, introspects. But it, does, it should not change the data itself on the disk. Never change it. Uh, I can have, I can create uh, ISOs or whatever on a disk, and I don't want to let the virtual machine change it. Yes? It's not really true that Manage IQ doesn't uh, modify the disk. So it's working as it taking a snapshot, but in some special cases, it might have to do things like journal recovery. Like? Journal recovery. So it's not. In that it, case, it's not a case. It only disk, it's a snapshot of a disk. As far as I know, they do not mount, in which case, they don't need to do journal recovery. They introspect. Actually, they have a way to introspect without mounting. Uh, the problem is that mount operation, even if you mount a file system, is read only. The mount operation itself can do uh, journal reconciliation, which will change the data. Uh, that, of course, can be destructive if you're exposing the disk of a running virtual machine to another machine. It, by definition, sees uh, an inconsistent view and will try to reconcile it, reaching uh, data corruption. Uh, so read-only disks uh, make sure that that will never happen. They, they don't mount. Uh, but, but I think they wanted to move towards using the FSFS for reading and the FSFS mounts. Could be. I, don't that, I mean, these are things that yeah. I heard. And yeah. So we have only have a couple of minutes. And really um, so support VM placing um, the ability to introspect on what's going on within and get data on 
on what files, what uh, applications are installed, um, uh, operating system, etc. Uh, and of course, we've mentioned this uh, before, live merge. <coughs> so the ability, while the virtual machine is running, to collapse QCO uh, images. Questions? So this was a lot of uh, a lot of information. Thank you for listening. Hope I didn't uh, uh, tire you out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all.